Modern. 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 We're prepping for a voyage. Modern. The force of an old fashioned equals whiskey mass times bitters acceleration. Why don't you make that a double? Modern Bar Cart. What's shaking, cocktail fans? Welcome to episode 210 of the Modern Bar Cart podcast. I'm your host, Eric Koslick. Thanks for joining me for another interview episode where we track down the best and brightest minds in the spirits and cocktail world so that we can share their secrets with you. This time around, I'm joined by Tim Warlow. He is the co-founder and CEO of Fever Tree, a UK-based tonic and mixers brand that changed and continues to change the way we think about the three quarters of our drink that isn't the booze. In this conversation, Tim and I dig into the ingredients and decisions that have allowed Fever Tree to transform professional and home bars alike with their glass bottles and innovative flavors, much to the dismay of soda gun purveyors everywhere. But before we hear some of the perilous lengths that Tim and his team have gone to in the effort of sourcing the purest ingredients in the world, let's take a moment so that you can make yourself a drink. This episode's featured cocktail is ranch water. And before you ask, no, it's not ranch dressing in water. To make this cocktail, which features prominently in this episode's lightning round, you'll need two to three ounces of tequila. Blanco is traditional, but aged versions like reposados can be used. One full ounce of lime juice and a refreshing carbonated mixer. Topo Chico mineral water is very popular, but two products in the Fever Tree line that would work nicely here are the Sparkling Lemon or the Mexican Lime and Yuzu Soda. In a highball glass or a double rocks glass with ice, add your tequila and your lime juice, then top with the carbonated mixer of your choice, garnish with an additional lime wedge, and enjoy. The Ranch Water Cocktail is, in essence, the West Texas take on a Tequila Collins. But what's most interesting to me about this cocktail is its irresistible capacity for tweaking and customization. What I just listed is the most pared down version of this cocktail, the minimum viable cocktail. But in many, if not most cases, ranch water is augmented with sugar in the form of a sweetened soda or an orange liqueur and with salt. Some might say this pushes it in the direction of a margarita highball, but to me, you know what? It sounds a lot like an electrolyte drink with a little extra love in it. Perfect to recover from the blistering heat of West Texas, where this drink was popularized. If you're going to sweeten your ranch water, I'd encourage you to consider allowing that sugar to pull double duty by infusing it with herbs or spices in a simple syrup, or even creating an oleosaccharum with citrus oils from those lime peels before you juice them. I could also see this cocktail as an excellent vehicle for an infused tequila. So the name of the game here is to make this incredibly flexible and refreshing template your own by adding a bit of extra flavor. So, now that you've learned one of the most popular cocktails in the Lone Star State, let's turn our attention back to the interview. In this effervescent and eye-opening conversation with Fever Tree co-founder and CEO, Tim Warlow, some of the topics we discuss include the drinks landscape in 2003 when Tim and his partner Charles met for coffee and then set out to fundamentally change the way we approach the oft-overlooked and even more oft-commodified carbonated mixers category. Why ingredient sourcing has played a pivotal role in Fever Tree's rise to cocktail stardom, leading Tim to dodge nail strips and rocket launchers in the search for the world's purest quinine. The symbiotic and dynamic relationship between premium spirits and premium mixers, and why Fever Tree looks to the world's best distillers as inspiration for new products and flavor combos. We also talk about Fever Tree's new Easy Mixing Book, which contains over 150 cocktails spanning beloved cocktail categories like the Mule, Highball, Summer Cup, Spritz, and even low and no ABV drinks. Along the way, we cover why Fever Tree only comes in glass bottles, how the flavor of Mexican limes depends entirely on the meteor that killed the dinosaurs, what to drink with philanthropist Bill Gates, and much, 
much more. If you've spent any time in the cocktail world, whether at home or in a professional context, you know Fever Tree. You know it for what it is, a reliably delicious product that transforms a standard long drink into a flavor experience. But having the chance to sit down with Tim for an hour really made me appreciate the work and the mindset responsible for that beautiful in-the-glass experience. We hear constantly, learn where your food comes from. Well, this is an opportunity to learn where your drink comes from. And in that endeavor, there's no better guide than Fever Tree's globetrotting, malaria-fighting chief executive, Tim Warlow. Tim, welcome to the podcast. Eric, thank you very much. Good, great to be here. So let's kick this interview off by just having you give us a basic introduction. Who are you? What do you do? And what are we here to talk about today? So uh, my name's Tim Warrillow. I am co-founder and CEO of Fever Tree Drinks Company. And we are here to talk about the wonderful world of tonic water and mixed drinks. Yes, indeed. So at, at this point in your career, I'm sure that you've told the origin story of Fever Tree many, many times. And I'd certainly like you to jump into that story and familiarize our listeners who may have tried many of your wonderful products, but not be aware of the story behind them. And the way that I'd like to sort of back us into that is by simply observing that the story of Fever Tree seems to involve a great deal of travel. And I think the idea of transporting someone through flavor might be something that we come back to here in this interview. So I'm just going to give you that one prompt, wide travel from many different countries and continents and just say, go ahead and tell us this amazing story. Well, I mean, it, it is a good prompt because absolutely that sits at the heart of, of the sort of invention of Fever Tree. I, I started the business with my business partner, Charles, Charles Rolls, and we met actually in, in 2003. And over a, a first cup of coffee, we, we met actually to talk about the world of gin, but over the first cup of coffee, uh, the conversation turned from gin to tonic. Uh, and that's because... Uh, both of us, from very separate experiences in the drinks industry, had both really had the same thought and observation and, and frankly, business idea. Uh, and, and that was that we had seen how the world of spirits was really starting to develop and evolve and change. And I'm sitting here in London at the moment uh, which is which is where the, the idea was conceived. So we were looking at this in the UK, but also we are aware of the same things going on around the world. And, and what I mean by that was the fact that, you know, the spirits industry was becoming ever more interested in provenance, in quality, in flavors, in process. And, you know, they were doing a fantastic job, you know, getting the consumer excited about these things. So, you know, the big spirit companies were concentrating more of their time and effort and money, educating people and really encouraging them to buy their more premium products and expressions. And, and at the same time, craft was just starting to find its way in the spirits industry. Interestingly, sort of tax rules and regulations were starting to change around the world, which encouraged small craft distillers to start having a go. And so there was talk about craft coming. And, uh, you know, perhaps a little different here in the UK to you and the, you guys in the US have always been you know, having fantastic cocktail bars and fantastic cocktail bar men and women. But here, actually, there was a real renaissance happening in the world of cocktails. And, you know, these wonderful bars were opening up and, you know, we're really getting great press coverage. Mixologists, you know, as the term was coined then, were starting to appear. And, and so, you know, all of this you know, fantastic energy was happening in and around the world of spirits. Yet, you know, what struck Charles and I was extraordinary. The very thing that the majority of these things were being mixed with, the mixer, was really rather overlooked, quite long forgotten, uh, had been the preserve of a couple of big global brands. And, you know, frankly, 
they were, I think, reveling in the fact that everyone had their eyes turned up and w watching what was going on in, in, in the world of spirits when they were sort of quietly, you know, running their business for manufacturing efficiency and rationalization. And so, you know, we saw how here in the UK, artificial sweeteners such as saccharin had found their way in across the whole of the range. I know the equivalent, you know, out there is high fructose corn syrup. So, so the point being is that, you know, the, these uh, mixers weren't keeping up with the way that the world of the spirits was developing. And we really sort of coined this thought, you know, sort of there and then is that, if you stop and think, and I'm using the example of gin and tonic because it's very close to the British heart. If you stop and think that three quarters of a gin and tonic is typically tonic, surely people should care as much about the quality of that part of the drink, you know, as the spirit, if not more so because of the uh, the percentages used. And, and so that was really uh, the germ of the idea. Um, and so we set out to then really go and put quality back in to tonic water, but mixers in, in all its forms. And, and this is a very long-winded answer to your question, Eric. I apologize. Uh, but coming back to your question about travel, um, so this you know, resulted in a very different approach. Uh, to product development and certainly a very different approach to the big soft drink companies we're used to. In our case, we went back into the history books to go and you know, research uh, the history of the, the drinks and the ingredients. And then we went out you know, personally, sort of Charles and I, all around the world, as we still do to this day, uh, to go and hunt, quite literally in some cases, you know, for these ingredients. It's been a absolutely essential part of, of the sort of fever tree proposition um, from day one. And, you know, the result is that it's taken us and, and me to some pretty weird and wonderful and beautiful and dangerous, you know, places all around the world in, in, in pursuit of ingredients to go into our mixers. Yeah. When when I think about the task that you're describing, which is to somehow translate or transport some essential ingredients, whether uh, that's one of the ingredients literally in the tonic itself, the, the quinine containing ingredients of the tonic, or some of the affiliated flavors that you've woven into some of your expressions over the years, it, it strikes me that as somebody who's on the ground, literally harvesting and turning over in your hand and sensing and tasting these ingredients, you have the delight of that experience, of course, but then there's the challenge of saying, okay, how do I take this raw material, this essential flavor building block, and then incorporate that into my product such that it transports the end consumer so that they can, if not like be sensing what I'm sensing right now with all of the in life, real world experiences, at least get a portion of that just simply in their evening gin and tonic. So can you describe some of those moments where you are actually visiting these places and interacting with what would later come to be ingredients in your beverages? Absolutely. And, and perhaps I should, you know, start with the, the ingredient you just referenced, uh, quinine. Um, because it is, after all, the essential ingredient in tonic water. And indeed, it what gives us our brand its name, because uh, quinine comes from the bark of the fever tree. And if I can bore your listener just, uh, you know, briefly, um, is that, you know, the whole history of tonic water, the whole reason tonic water came about was because of this miraculous ingredient, quinine because quinine was the only ingredient that could prevent people from catching malaria or indeed cure them from malaria. And, and this was at a time when malaria was the single biggest killer in the world. And to this day, it still remains, you know, tragically one of the biggest killers. But so it was discovered that this amazing ingredient, you know, could cure people. And so it was actually the British 
that gave it to their troops out in India. This is back in sort of 1820 as a medicine in the morning. Um, and and if you've ever done as I have, which is, is taste it in its rawest, neatest form, you'll realize it's incredibly bitter. You know, that is where that wonderful sort of bitterness comes from. Uh, but if you taste it undiluted, you'll realize quite how bitter it was. So understandably, these troops, you know, who were made to take this medicine, what they naturally did was they used to mix it with sugar and water and the local botanical fruits that were around to try and help the medicine go down. Mm -hmm. um, what the British were also famous uh, for always traveling with at the time was a ration of gin. Um, so this is, you know, they found that with their officer's permission, they could mix their morning medicine, their morning tonic water with a good, healthy dose of gin. And that's how gin and tonic came about. But, but your point, you know, quinine is the essential ingredient. And actually my research uh, in the libraries, you know, uh, made me realize that there was this one last remaining plantation of the highest quality quinine that, that was left. Unfortunately, it happened to be in just about the most remote and lawless place on the planet. And that was right in the middle of Africa, uh, in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, you know, to give you an idea about quite how remote it was for me just to get there, I had to fly from London to Nairobi uh, in Kenya, from, uh, from Nairobi to Kigali in Rwanda, and then persuade the local taxi driver to drive me the eight or nine hours across Rwanda. And that was just to get to the border uh, of the DRC. And then an example of how lawless it was, just in those few, few miles that I had to go from the border to, to the plantation, I got stopped three times with these different uh, armed roadblocks. Um, and, you know, the, the first one was memorable for the fact they threw the plank of six inch nails out in front of the car which is a very effective way to get you to stop uh and the second one something similar but it's the third one that has remained um burnt into my memory and that's the fact that a, a sort of young guy with a rocket launcher sort of stumbles out of the uh, of the scrub along the side of the road uh, which is also, you know, an effective way of getting you to stop. So, I mean, you know, that's that's an idea of how laws it is. But, but it was a fantastic, memorable, and really worthwhile trip because we, to this day, get all of our quinine, as we call it here in the UK, or quinine, as you call it, from from this, you know, wonderful source uh, there. But, but that that that's the background to quinine. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, you say it's uh, the highest quality. When you were doing this research, what was the indicator to you that sort of set that flag off in your mind that said, ah, this is the quality that we want for fever tree? So, so what it is in, in its sort of most simple form is uh, the purest. And so the least impurities and so the cleanest taste in terms of bitterness. I see. I see. That makes a lot of sense to me because... I work with a number of bitter ingredients, and one of the things that uh, we always prioritize is that clean bitterness. I find it often in gentian, and uh, it seems like in, in quinine, you can kind of seek out the same attribute where there are varying levels of sort of cleanness. So that seems to be important. Now, some of the other countries that are mentioned, uh, and these are also sort of called out in uh, in the book that you're coming out with, which we'll uh, speak about later on in the interview. But uh, a couple of the other countries that are mentioned are, uh, of course, India and Mexico. Uh, are there ingredients from either of those countries uh, that have a particularly fun story behind them? Well, I mean, I have to say, I mean, in both, actually, but... Um, you know, let, let's talk about Mexico because that, that was one of my last trips, sadly, before uh, COVID got in the way. Um, and that was because we were developing a lime uh, soda, a Mexican lime and yuzu soda um, to go with tequila. Um, and, and so, again, you know, it's a case of sort of going – you know, back to talk to the experts and also read up about limes. And you suddenly realize there is this wonderful world of limes, you know, out there, all with their different cultivars uh, coming from different parts of the world. But the one that I was told 
time and again, you know, was worth going to was was Mexico, um, and and specifically the Yucatan province in in Mexico. And the reason was, which you know, until I arrived there, I hadn't sort of quite appreciated. But that was the 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 part of the world that the meteorite hit that wiped out the dinosaurs. So the result is, is that, as you can imagine, it hit with such force that it drove uh, all the sort of water underground and the rocks to the surface because it wiped out effectively, you know, that that part of the earth. And and so it, it, it seems a sort of unusual place to be cultivating citrus fruit as a result. But but the climate is perfect for it. Um, and what it means is that the citrus has to work very hard to go and get their source of water. And so in turn, that sort of intensity is replicated in the flavor of the limes and, and the fruits that they produce. And, and it was staggering. You know, I mean, when you're there uh, trying these, these limes and frankly, these citrus fruits, because there's so many different citrus fruits there that, you know, I'd never heard of and that we haven't heard of. But, you know, there, there is just this, this intensity to flavor that, you know, you wished you could go and, and buy in your local sort of retailer or grocery store because, you know, I'd never tried anything like it. But, but that, that's where we get our limes from. One thread that I'm picking up here is qualitative versus quantitative, I guess, quality. Uh, it seems like one of the things that you immediately noticed in your initial conversations with Charles is that the people who were doing the most quantity were doing the lowest quality. And there's one approach to quality that says like, well, maybe the most limey lime thing is going to be what people want. So instead of trying to find high quality limes, they try and throw more of whatever the accepted artificial substitute for lime might be. If I were somebody running a large soda company like you were referencing, that's probably how I would initially say like, all right, well, let's just make it really intensely the same as it always has been, just more intense, the same, but more. That what the two stories that you just told me seem to indicate is that you're going for more of a qualitative quality. You're saying, well, instead of going, instead of just throwing more garbage, that let's let's go for the less of the higher quality stuff. Is is that even remotely accurate based on what what you're? So I, absolutely, in the fact that we were all about trying to find the highest quality natural ingredient. Mm -hmm. um, now you know that comes at a cost and it comes at a complication. I can assure you, I it, it took us eighteen months to develop our first product, and I asked myself many times during that process. What the hell are we doing? You know, I absolutely see why people use artificial ingredients because they're so much easier to use and so much more readily available. Uh, but, but the truth is, is when you think about it, all an artificial flavor is trying to do is replicate that wondrous natural flavor that we love. And so, you know, that was not our principle. You know, we wanted to go and find the original and natural flavor. You're quite right. That's that has been our pursuit, you know, from the start and remains so. Well, and I love just the way that you were describing the limes is exactly how people will describe uh, grapes being subjected to the pressures of terroir in various regions. So uh, it makes complete sense that uh, those limes would be so attractive to you. So now that we've sort of figured out the governing fever tree ethos, the mission that drives the company, and some of the examples of how you've gone at that mission from an ingredient sourcing perspective. I guess I'll zoom us out just slightly and ask you, what makes a good tonic? Because I feel like there are a number of different qualities. Ingredients, of course, is one of them. But what are some of the other qualities? You mentioned that it took something like 18 months to develop your recipe. What were some of the trial and error things that occurred during that time that eventually drove you toward that ideal tonic? Well, I tell you, one of the things that, that really took the time was using natural ingredients uh, and not preserving them artificially. Because a natural ingredient is, uh, as we know, it changes in flavor over time. So we would develop you know, the, the, the first iteration and love it. And then we had to you know, shelf test it. 
and then you realize coming back you know after a few months that actually the the flavor of migrated a bit so again you see why people just put artificial preservatives in because you know using artificial ingredients it just sets it at that moment in time but uh, but we were determined not to for all the reasons we're describing so that's you know what t- took us a long time but but the the other bit so if you're describing a perfect tonic it is of course all about the ingredients and in this case we use our quinine and we use eight different natural botanical flavors and so you know we spend a lot of time you know playing around with that recipe but the other thing uh, that is so important is carbonation there is nothing that kills a vodka and tonic or a mixed drink like a poorly carbonated product because the whole point about carbonation is it lifts the flavor uh, of the tonic water but also the spirit you're mixing it with so if you think about it you're putting a flat spirit you know on top of this carbonated drink so it needs you know even more carbonation to be able to mix uh, the ingredients and and at the same time you know it helps you know lift the flavor so you know when you're drinking that drink it's not just the flavor you get in your mouth but it's the the sensory flavor you know up your nose and everything else so you know carbonation is so so important and so that took quite a bit of time uh, uh getting that right and then i mean it wasn't so much the time it took but you know we were very keen and still are to push this product particularly in the hotel bar restaurant market in a single serve glass bottle so using glass because glass remains you know the best way of preserving premium freshness uh, and fizz you know i mean don't forget that you know plastic or pet is you know the majority of the market's in that leaches flavor and carbonation you can't carbonate it so highly in the first place but it actually is a porous uh, substance so you know that that was the other es- essential component of it so so it's those those you know critical aspects you know that that make for the perfect uh, tonic water yes and we do have an episode for our listeners tuning in who'd like to learn more about carbonation in its various forms uh, we have an episode called bursting bubbles that we will link to on the show notes page over at modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast and um you know one one other thing i wanted to talk about is the role of sweetness in a tonic because as you mentioned a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down right this is the original incarnation of tonic uh how how do you at fever tree think about and implement that sweetness knowing that at the time when you launch this and perhaps even more so now there is a very intense reaction against sugar in general um and so knowing that that's a necessary component of the product how do you think about it at fever tree well um the, the, the truth is, is that we have our classic uh, tonic water uh, and tonic waters and mixes, I might add, that use natural cane sugar. Um, and th- that I think we've got to be so careful in, in the sugar discussion and debate uh, about demonizing sugar. Because, you know, this is what I learned, you know, in this process, is there is no replica for sugar in terms of a flavor carrier and for this all-important mouthfeel and you know it, it's quite simply the best you know there's there's no way you can replicate it so so our view is we've, we've produced that but what we've also done is produce a lower calorie not a no calorie version because as far as we believe you can't do that using natural sweeteners and retain the all important you know flavor profile so we've used a much more intensely sweet um gosh suddenly I, the, uh, my mind's gone blank stevia perhaps no sorry fruit sugar <laughs> there we go that was difficult but um so fruit sugar by its nature is is much more intensely sweet so it allows us to put less in uh, mm-hmm. so that allows us to bring our calorie level down um, so we've got those two versions. And, and frankly speaking, you know, they are doing extremely well. I mean, you mentioned stevia and, you know, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at stevia and playing stevia. But the problem is, you know, it has that licorice back taste. And, you know, that's a very, very hard thing to mask. And, you know, in the end, 
you know, we are here to produce the very best tasting product. And so that is, you know, the, the guidelines that we are working in. So, but, but I have to say, our lower calorie products are, are doing incredibly well. I mean, here in the UK, it's now our biggest uh, range. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, they're very popular here in the US as well. Uh, and, and I do want to just return qu very quickly to something that you were speaking about. Obviously, the glass bottles are incredibly important, not only for the reasons that you were mentioning previously, which is the ability to carbonate more intensely and uh, the ability to retain and not leach flavor, but also just for the experience. Because if you're the kind of person who agrees with Tim and your assertion that if the mixer is three quarters of the drink, then it should be good, then necessarily, you should be comfortable with paying a higher price. And when I pay a higher price for something as somebody who's a cocktail drinker, whether I'm doing it in the home or out at a cocktail bar, I'm expecting a more elevated experience. And to me, that glass bottle, especially early on, especially, you know, perhaps not in 2005, 2006, because I wasn't really drinking cocktails at that time, but certainly five to seven years later, when I would go out to a bar and see them pick up a bottle of Fever Tree as opposed to something in a small plastic bottle, that was a signal to me. And I think that was a very important signal. Um, so I don't know if that's something that also plays into Fever Tree's approach to innovating and uh, releasing products is like that, that how, how you make the, the guest feel. Is that something that you can speak to? Absolutely. You know, that club serve about, you know, putting that fresh single serve bottle by the spirit adds, as you say, it, importantly to the ritual and ceremony of the drink. But it's also adds to the enjoyment for the simple reason that everyone likes spirit mixed to a different level. It's an extraordinary thing. And, and so having the ability to do it yourself, it makes your enjoyment of that drink, you know, in, in, improve immeasurably. And so that's why it's so important that club serve. And Eric, what you didn't then touch on, which I thought is where you were going to go, it is to the soda gun. Because that, to me, you know, is one of the great crimes, you know, that gun, that, that weapon of mass destruction, as I like to call it. Because, you know, there are we talking about all, you know, the time and trouble uh, that has gone into these beautiful spirits that have been lovingly distilled and aged. Yet then they get drowned you know, with this product that is incredibly poorly carbonated and it's back to that carbonation point, you know, and that's the sort of tragedy of using a gun is, is frankly the carbonation. But yes, so that's why single serve bottle is, is, is a very wondrous experience. The other affiliated tragedy is that the line that that liquid goes through is often the least sanitary line in the entire bar in that it rarely if ever gets cleaned uh so so yes single serve bottles are great for everyone uh and i think the the other thing when i started to see fever tree pop up in retail locations and behind bars here in the u.s one of the things that i noticed soon after i saw the original tonic was that there were some different flavors uh, that, that you were putting out that sort of, at that point, really were blazing a trail into uncharted tonic territory, at least as far as I'm concerned, as far as I had experienced. So can you talk about some of the, maybe one or two of the important flavors and like how those changed the game. Uh, I mean, I see some beautiful, beautiful pink bottles right behind you. I don't know if that's a good prompt. <laughs> well, no, it, it, it is. And I mean, your point, you know, it's kind of you say, because it, it really was the case that, you know, one of the things that we had noticed uh, about the category was not only, as we were talking about earlier, about the qualities of it or the lack of, but was also how it had been rationalized to the point where choice had been taken out. I mean, there wasn't much choice at the best of times, but, you know, it had been rationalized. And I always remember we did one focus group, uh, Charles and I, right at the outset. And it's memorable for the fact that it was rather dominated by this one quite formidable uh, lady who, you know, at one point said, 
the thing is about the mixer category when I'm in my retailer or in a grocery store, it's so boring. You know, there is nothing there. I sleepwalk my way through it is what she said because uh, I'm not asked to make any choice. Um, whereas I turn the corner and suddenly there am I in, you know, the chocolate aisle, the tea aisle, the coffee aisle. And I'm, I'm inundated with choice and provenance and flavors. And so, you know, we took that very much uh, um, to heart. But we went about our product development sort of a bit differently in the fact that, you know, we started to develop different styles of tonic water specifically to go with the different styles of gin and vodkas that were coming to the market. And so, you know, to give you one example uh, was our Mediterranean tonic water, which is one of our earliest uh, flavor expressions. And that's because, you know, there are all these, you know, people call them new age gins, you know, that were coming to the market, which were frankly lighter in style, you know, less uh, juniper heavy. And so we, we thought, you know, this, this warranted a different style of tonic water to go, go with it. Uh, in that case, we use these wonderful sort of rosemary and lemon thyme that we found from this brilliant farmer in Provence, third generation farmer. And so that's got a more subtle uh, floral flavor to it. So that, that's how we've gone about it. And, and I'm conscious I've talked a lot about tonic water so far, but, you know, it's not to forget that we've got this sort of full range uh, of mixers and you know in the case of our ginger products which are which are doing really well our ginger ale and ginger beer we're doing just the same thing there we're starting to introduce different styles of ginger ale to go with the different styles of spirits so for instance a spiced orange ginger ale which naturally goes with the sort of orange flavors you get in whiskies and bourbons um so we're we're using you know the same approach as we did with tonic at the outset but it's, it's really worked you know and the fact that consumers have i think really enjoyed the fact that there's this choice and it allows them to sort of quite simply play with different flavor expressions themselves mm. it seems like it's an also an opportunity to extend the conversation and continue extending the conversation in a different way than you did at the outset of fever tree which was simply to say there's no choice and there's low quality. Well, you fixed that by existing and sourcing the way that you did initially. And now, well, there is selection and there is quality. So what's next? It seems like what's next is to, you know, be in conversation with the trends of the time, with the different gins emerging, with different consumer preferences about what cocktails are popular with their various drinks. Uh, and so it seems like that is a distinctly different opportunity than the one or two that you had at the outset. So uh, it, it seems like a natural evolution of the company to me, but I don't know that it would seem like that to everyone. But just, just to scratch my own itch, what are the, uh, the pink bottles behind you for our listeners who can't see them? So th this is our new uh, rhubarb and raspberry tonic water, which will be finding its way uh, over to the US uh, next year. And we, we launched them here in the UK and in Europe, and, and they've proved you know, really popular because, uh, as, as you all have seen, you know, there's this sort of pink gin uh, revolution happening. So this has been, you know, purposely developed to go with, you know, that growing world of pink gins. Mm -hmm. Well, we're excited uh, for, for it to arrive here in the U.S. Uh, ho hopefully it's on one of the faster boats that finds its way into a port where it can actually be unloaded. Well, if you know where one of those faster boats are, please let me know because we're struggling <laughs> to find them at the moment. This episode is brought to you by Near Country Provisions. If you're like me... Here are some things you might be like. You live in the Mid-Atlantic. You enjoy meat. You highly prefer that your meat is local, sustainable, and comes from ethically raised animals. And you'd absolutely love for someone to deliver it to your door once a month. If this sounds like you, then you need Near Country provisions in your life. Head over to nearcountry.com and check out their different, highly customizable meat delivery packages, and also browse their growing seafood selection. As a thank you for being a Modern Bar Cart listener, you can get two free pounds of ground beef or bacon included in your first order after subscribing if you enter the code BARCART, all one word, at checkout. That's BARCART, B-A-R-C-A-R-T, at checkout. Near Country Provisions is 
the real deal. And I can honestly say that I'd recommend them even if they weren't a sponsor. The meat and the local farmers they work with are just that good. Now, back to the show. But what has happened, uh, particularly in these last five or six years, has been this move towards, frankly, drinking spirits, but, you know, drinking them long and mixed uh, rather than neat or, or, or shots uh, or indeed in short cocktails. So this is what is incredibly exciting for us is to see this developing really all across the world. People are choosing, you know, these long, refreshing spirit-based drinks. I mean, you know, we are loving the, the, the mule that is, you know, continuing to develop fast out there in the U.S., you know, we've, we've recently launched our pink grapefruit product uh, for a Paloma in the U.S. I mentioned our lime and yuzu soda, which goes with tequila uh, there in the U.S. And then, of course, we've got, we've got all the tonics and then all these ginger ale-based products to go with all the whiskies and dark spirits. And this really is what we're seeing, you know, happening all around the world. And in Europe, our spritz business with our sort of soda line is growing quickly. And, and we've got uh, high hopes for high balls in Asia. So, you know, it is actually an incredibly exciting time. Yes. I recently went to a, a potluck dinner where everyone was uh, supposed to bring something and I was charged with bringing the drink. So I grabbed a few bottles of that pink grapefruit and some tequila. And we had a little Paloma bar. I brought some different garnishes and some different options there and, and uh, everybody loved it. So I can definitely confirm that the pink grapefruit is a, is a really exciting one now that we're, I, I think I should encourage people to get it now before it gets any colder here in the US. Uh, but certainly there's some exciting options, as you mentioned, with the, the spice, the spiced orange uh, ginger ale seems to be a, a really beautiful option for the holidays, which are coming up. So if you're planning uh, maybe some some holiday travel and you uh, pick up a bottle of whiskey, maybe think about picking up a, a four pack of those mixers as well. Um, but this this brings me, you know, your mention of mules brings me to the book that you're coming out with here. And when I was informed that Fever Tree was publishing a whole book, I had two immediate thoughts. One, it's probably a very short book. And then two, how how much can you write about just tonic water recipes, right? It's tonic or it's a mixer. You stick it, you, you put the booze in the tonic, you put the booze in the seltzer and, and or the soda, and that's about it. And what I was really surprised with when I actually reviewed the digital copy of the book that you sent along was how in depth you were able to get with these products, how thoughtfully you were able to go into the various categories and how many categories there were where tonics and mixers actually played such a pivotal role. The mule category, of course, we just mentioned the tonic we've been speaking about for a while, but there's also the summer cup or Pim's cup category, the large format pitchers with various different fruit profiles. You've got, uh, of course, the different highballs. And then we also, importantly, spend quite a long time in this book talking about the low and no ABV drinks, which is a huge category right now. So I was, I was, uh, you know, going into it, just assuming it was going to be a quick little, almost like a, a, a pocket guide or a, a short handbook. And it really is a really in-depth look at all of the various ways you might employ these mixers. So, uh, Walk us a little bit through the book, if, if you don't mind. Well, the, the book really was born uh, out of COVID uh, in, in the fact that, you know, what was quite interesting is that, you know, when everyone was locked down at home, of course, they started to turn their attention to their drinks cabinet. Um, and, and then what ensued, you know, was us in receipt uh, of all of these questions about what do you mix with what? And can I mix that with that? And how can I make this more simply than, um, you know, I'm told I need to make it? And so, you know, what really was became sort of obvious to us, which is really what we're de describing this trend around the world, is people actually want to drink these spirits, but, you know, they're not uh, bartenders by training. And, you know, they don't want it to take an awful long time. So if you can put sort of two fantastic ingredients together, what ingredients should you put together? And frankly, 
look at the variety. Uh, and so the way we've done the book is just as you described, we split it up into tonics and spritzes and mules and highballs. And, and, and as you mentioned about the sort of pins, cups, a low and no, and then pitchers. So all of that variety. But you can either make them, as we've given you a recipe, with using just two ingredients and a garnish and nice glassware. Or if you're showing off a bit, uh, we've given you an option to, you know, add one or two more ingredients. But, but what is coming through loud and clear, really, from consumers is they love spirits, um, they like drinking them long, but they don't like spending too long having to make them because that puts them off making them at home. So, you know, give me the tools to make these delicious drinks quickly and simply. So that was the, the motivation behind it. And, and we're, we're, we're excited by, you know, the prospects for it. Yeah. Is the book going to be available due, uh, from a certain publisher or is it already available on Amazon? How do we get our hands on this book? Yes, yeah, so it's available on Amazon uh, and and available on on good, well reputed, you know, bookshops and and booksellers. So you know, you should be able to lay your hands on it. Beautiful, great, uh, great for the uh, as you say the holiday season coming up. Yes, that's that was going to be my next comment. It is in addition to being a quite useful text, uh, it's also very beautiful. Uh, I I think tonics and long drinks in general really, really lend themselves to light mode photos. So very bright, airy photos, uh, lots of beautiful garnishes and uh, different colorful flavors associated with it. So from an inspiration standpoint, I also really liked uh, scrolling through my copy on the computer and just saying, oh, I didn't think about uh, putting those two flavors together before, or, ooh, uh, I think I might try that garnish next time. Like you mentioned, I need to show off a little bit. So I think there, there's, there's a little, for anybody who's into spirits and cocktails at home, there's a little part of you that likes to show off just a little bit. And I think this book just perfectly scratches that particular itch. So um, a, a wonderful... A wonderful sort of addition to the product line is this resource about how to use it, uh, especially now that uh, you have so many more products than you did at the outset, which leads me to, I suppose, the future. Uh, what does the future hold for you in particular, Tim, and for Fever Tree in general? Do you have anything coming up that you're really excited about? Well, nothing that I can announce, uh, but but really what I would say is the fact that, as I was describing, it is very exciting the way this sort of trend towards premium spirits and drinking them long and mix is just growing and growing and growing and growing across all of these different spirit categories. I mean, uh, you know, to give you an example, I mean, we've just launched out in South Korea, and that's because there's a growing trend there that they're mixing their national drink of soju with tonic, which is the first time. And again, for all the same reasons that the sort of younger generation are, are less wanting to drink it neat and by the bottle because they, for health and wellness reasons, but they still love the taste of it. So they want to drink it long in a refreshing way. So, you know, I mean, that's uh, our, our sort of latest, you know, country that we've just launched in, you know, with, with that in mind. So what we're seeing is all of these growing opportunities around the world, you know, working with all these different, you know, spirit producers and you know, spirit trends as they develop. So I think it's going to fortunately involve a lot more ingredient hunting and, and a lot more visits to, you know, fascinating places. So really, there's just an awful lot to, to do and to go after. Well, for my part, uh, I personally hope that you are able to avoid as many six inch nails and rocket launchers as possible on future trips for uh, ingredient hunting. But uh, I do hope that you'll come back and, and share any other stories with us when, uh, when you launch the next round of products uh, from what looks to be a, a, an exciting continued expansion. As you mentioned, closely listening to 
the trends in the spirits world. So uh, I really do appreciate that mindset. I appreciate the partnership that you're doing with spirits brands in that, uh, you know, if drinking spirits long and refreshing is truly the trend, then uh, it seems like a partnership with Fever Tree is, is something that uh, a lot of brands could stand to benefit from. So thank you for the work that you've done in that vein. And is there anything else that we have omitted that you really want our listeners, especially here in the US, to know before we move on to the lightning round? I don't think so, Eric. You, you've been very kind uh, in, in in talking about the book and, and all the different uh, products uh, that we're, we're now got in market and, and looking to launch in market in the, in the coming, coming months and years. So no, I think that that's been well covered. Yes, indeed. So we will certainly have a link to purchase the book over on the show notes page modernbarcart.com forward slash podcast. If you're listening to this episode, that page should be live. So right now we're going to jump into the lightning round. First question, uh, what's your favorite cocktail? And if you don't have a favorite of all time, what's something you've been more recently obsessed with? And if I can throw the qualifier outside of G&T's, what is your favorite co cocktail? Well, as you say, very hard to pick a favorite. Um, but, but well, I suppose in answer to your question, what's the last one I drank, which was a dark and stormy, actually. Mm. Uh, I was out with, uh, with Charles Rolls, who I saw the business with last night, and, and I was having a dark and stormy. I love dark and stormies, but, but they are so dependent, without trying to sound like a dreadful salesman, on the quality of the ginger beer. So, you know, a great dark rum with a great ginger beer with beautiful squeeze of lime, I think is a very, very hard drink to beat. It really is. It really is. And there are so many options. You know, if there's one spirits category that's expanding even more quickly than gin right now, it's the world of rum. So uh, we've definitely gotten, I think Europe is certainly ahead of the US in this respect. So uh, lots of delicious dark and stormy options available on the market. Um, next question, if you could have a cocktail with anybody in the world, past or present, who would it be? Where would you go? What would you drink? Just paint us a picture picture well i mean that again is a pretty hard question isn't it i mean there you know there are so many people that i can imagine it'd be quite good fun uh, and amusing to yeah, have a cocktail with i can always think of lots of sort of sporting heroes when i was young that you know i've always dreamt of meeting so i, I can imagine those although everyone does say don't they don't meet your heroes you know it's, it t tends to be a bit disappointing but actually, the person I think would be most interesting that, that I, I would love the opportunity to have a cocktail with is, is an American man, uh, Bill Gates, hardly an original name. But I tell you why, for the simple reason, I was talking about malaria early on. And, you know, I've always been unbelievably impressed by, you know, the way he's deployed, you know, his funds. And he is working incredibly hard. Uh, to try and eradicate malaria, and it's a it's a charity uh, that we have been involved in, you know, for for quite a long time. And I've actually personally been very involved in it. And in fact, there's a charity we're working with where we're uh, the Gates Foundation, and, and we're sort of funding it. But I mean, I, I would be fascinated because I know he's really gone to school uh, on malaria and and how to eradicate it. So I think that would be a fascinating conversation to have. And I think it's probably quite interesting on many other subjects as well. Um, right. And so I think I think you asked me where it would be. Well, I suspect he's got probably better venues than I can offer. So so I, I'd happily take his lead on that. Uh, yeah. And then a drink. I mean, who knows? But um, I mean, we talked about limes earlier. I mean, and, you know, with the U.S. in mind is that, you know, I've been sort of educated on the world of tequila. I mean, you know, here in the U.K., we we drink very little tequila and the tequila we drink, you know, doesn't tend to be the highest quality. We tend to drink it late at night um, uh, uh, when, you know, there are no other options. And so, you know, traveling a lot to the U.S. has really opened my mind to te tequila. So, you know, the ranch water, tequila and, you know, our, our sort of lime soda, I think it's a fantastic drink. So if he's prepared to have one of those with me, I'd be only too delighted. That sounds like an amazing cocktail, an amazing conversation. And it brings me back to a bit of a full circle moment for us. I mean, we were talking, of course, about how tonic water has its history as an anti-malarial. And uh, you were mentioning that it was the British that sort of rationed this out to their troops. Uh, and I 
did not do the research before this conversation, and I certainly should have, but I believe it was during the building of the Panama Canal uh, that quinine was actually isolated in its chemical form so that it could then be mass produced in a pill format. And of course, as soon as quinine was isolated and able to be created in a chemical format, that is sort of when the timeline for all of these sort of artificial tonics got kicked off, which brings us back to fever tree as a reaction to that. So it seems like there's sort of- a I'm, I'm very impressed of- by your knowledge, you know, particularly as you say, very much you haven't done the research before, but exactly right, you know, quinine and the Panama Canal, you know, the construction of it go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And uh, and also brings us back to the fact that there's probably a lot of ships sitting in that canal right now. <laughs> so uh, amazing. Well, the last question here in the lightning round is since you've been working so closely with spirits brands and uh, clearly are well versed in your cocktails, do you have any controversial opinions perhaps in the spirits and cocktail space or the beverage space in general? I, I wouldn't say so much controversial, but I think in many ways, actually, I, I've, I've sort of uh, spoke about it earlier on. But, you know, to me, that without going over all ground, but the soda gun, you know, that, that, that's the bit I still can't believe when I'm really referring to the US is quite so prevalent. Um, you know, bearing in mind, you know, all the wonderful investment that goes into those sort of fabulous venues out there in the US and all the concern about fixtures and fittings and of course all the fantastic spirits. The fact that that soda gun is still so prevalent. So some might see that as controversial, I don't know. Uh, but I see that as something that that really does need uh, fixing uh, because you know it's the one thing that I think you know, uh, uh, is taking away from what uh, otherwise I always think in America, you get these amazing uh, spirit drinks in amazing cocktail bars, but I still see that soda gun, you know, too prevalent. It's to me sort of reminds me of trying to water a large garden with a hose that doesn't have a sprayer attachment on it. You're just sort of sloppily just kind of waving the water all over the place and it doesn't provide good coverage. It doesn't accomplish what you want it to. Why not just like spend an extra couple dollars and go and get yourself a hose that actually gets the job done that you're looking to get. So, so yeah, I couldn't agree more. The soda gun, luckily, especially in the larger markets here in the US and the, the higher end bars, you're not going to encounter the soda gun nearly as much as you would have about a decade ago, uh, or certainly when Fever Tree first took off. So if that- It's really in- true, isn't it, Eric? I, I, I am, I mean, I sadly haven't been in America for the last 18 months, but but even then, and I'm obviously hearing from my team out there that it is starting to to be removed, just perhaps not as quickly as it should be. Well, and and uh, I think a, a good way to wrap this up would be to say, uh, I think that at least in some of the higher end cocktail establishments that uh, Fever Tree has played no small part in uh, the disenfranchisement of the uh, of the soda gun, which uh, which personally I am I'm grateful for. So. Tim, please just remind us how we can get in touch with you and with Fever Tree digitally on social media. Well, um, in in my case, I have to say, uh, with, without sounding like a real sort of luddite, I, I'm not. I, I don't use social media that much personally. We certainly do as a business. Um, but if you want to get in in contact with me, um, please just you know through the website. Uh, fevertree.com and and that that's the best place to go full stop because uh, that you'll find your links to to everywhere else through there but I'd be only too delighted uh, all the messages gets passed through to uh, to to make contact well we will have links to all of that and more over on the show notes page one last time modern bar cart dot com forward slash podcast tim this has been such a treat for me uh thanks to you for coming on and uh sharing some of your secrets and some of the awesome history that kind of explains why we are where we are in the cocktail renaissance and thanks most importantly for being a guest here on the modern bar cart podcast well eric thank you very much as i said at the beginning i'm very flattered to be asked and you know i i just hope uh, between us, we, we've we've helped uh, lift people's spirits about the the future of long mixed drinks. Cheers to that, and uh, thanks everyone for listening.
Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, there's two big things you can do for us here at Modern Bar Cart. One would be to tell your friends and family if you think they'd enjoy listening to us talk about cocktails. And if they don't download podcasts, they can always stream our episodes on their desktop directly from the show notes page at modernbarcart.com. The other thing you can do to help would be to head on over to iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts and leave us a review. Five stars are great, but we're more interested in your feedback. And the beauty is, the more reviews we have, the easier it will be for other folks out there to learn about our show. We're trying to start a cocktail revolution here, and by spreading the word, you're helping us fight the good fight. You can always reach us by emailing podcast at modernbarcart.com if you're looking for cocktail or bartending advice, or if you're a pro who would like to pull up a mic and be interviewed for all to hear. Also, definitely follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Modern Bar Cart for cocktail porn, recipes, and entertaining tips. And keep an eye out for new product releases and special offers, which are happening all the time. We love our listeners and we really enjoy giving you exclusive discounts and sneak peeks at our latest and greatest cocktail projects. This episode may be over, but for you, the mixological fun and adventures are just beginning. So remember folks, drink responsibly and experiment boldly. This episode was made possible with editing and sound design by Samantha Reed, Tonic and Soda Insights, courtesy of Fever Tree co-founder and CEO Tim Warlow, and a little bit of interview magic by yours truly. This has been a Modern Bar Cart production, copyright 2021.